Kia ora Church Farm, no, no my heart of my uh, welcome aboard. Uh, right now I'm sitting out on sailing vessel on Dean, our family yacht, and um, here we are. So good to have you here out on this old um, 60, maybe 70 year old girl. Yeah, she's 70. And um, and uh, yeah, it's a nice peaceful spot and I thought I'd come out here to get this message together for you. Um, I'm excited because I know God does have a word for us as a church family. Uh, understand it's this is a it's a harder time isn't it? it's hard not being able to come all together but hopefully you're around some lovely people hopefully you're at a watch party or you're sitting with some family right now and um, feeling loved and so we're kicking off our new series today on harvest Jesus says in John chapter 4 um, don't say there's four months and then and then a harvest he he tells us that he says, "Look now, the, the 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 fields are ripe and ready for harvest," and um, and I think that's the challenge for us today is is we shouldn't be people as followers of Jesus saying in four months' time or in the next season or maybe when this changes, then we can look to serve, look to um, see what God's going to give us and see what He has for us. I, I I believe that Jesus says, "Hey, now there's a harvest now." And part of how we look at that is um, is uh, in serving. Um, we serve one another because we know that God's doing something, and in serving one another and serving our community, uh, we're going to share the gospel. And so today, in our series about harvest, we are looking at serving. And specifically, I want to take us below the waterline of serving um, to examine what's driving us and uh, and see what Jesus is saying there. Um, right now, I'm sitting below the waterline in, in the boat. Um, the water's about here. I don't know if you can see that. And um, and I'm sitting below the waterline. And a lot of the mahi, a lot of the, the, the stuff, the reasons why the boat moves the way she does is because of what's happening below the waterline. It's easy to look at a boat and think, oh, it's all because of the sails and what's happening above the waterline. But but really, um, and the most significant part is what's happening below. And it's like that in our lives. We look at somebody, and we can see what's above the waterline in their lives. We look at somebody who serves well and dresses well. They look flash, and they've got all their teeth. <laughs> um, and we think, oh, man, that's, that's, that's awesome. But we don't see below the waterline. And that's what I want to do today is, is, is in all of our capacity and all of what we do and as a church community is in, our, in our relationships and the way we serve one another and the way we serve in church, let's go below, below the waterline this morning um, and see what Jesus, uh, how Jesus wants to encourage us to serve one another. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 31. And we're going to be going all the way through to chapter 13 and um, and touching on also a verse from chapter 14. But um, yeah, let's, let's go there. Uh, but first, let's pray. Hey, Jesus, we um, bless you and we thank you for our church family. And we just know that you are faithful. And in this season, you'll get us through. We know that you have good things for us. We declare your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, in my words, you might find good good ideas on a good day, but in His word, you'll find um, life giving hope every day. So, we're going to come to the word. Um, Pastor Paul says, uh, the Apostle Paul says in First Corinthians, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love. I am becoming a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, but I have um, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely and does not seek its own. It is not provoked and it thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 
But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether they are, there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will even vanish away. But For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is calm, that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as also I am known, and now abide. Faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And we're going to jump through to chapter 14, verses 12. Where Paul continues and he says, So even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. The um, go-to wedding verse, right? And the point that Paul's drawing out is he wants the church to be driven to serve. And he's, he's talking about the way we serve with our spiritual gifts and what spiritual gifts we have and also the gift of leadership and different um, appointments of leadership within the church and different ways we serve one another. The heart of it is about how we serve one another and that we seek to excel for the edification, for the building up of the church. For the building up of the church. We want to seek to excel for the building up of the church. But how, what does that look like? And Paul says the more excellent way. I'll show you a more excellent way. Not just seeking after gifts. Not just seeking after the build up the edification. But I'll show you the more excellent way. And he talks about love. Today the to go beneath the waterline of our lives. And the beneath the waterline of why we do what we do. And why we serve. And how we continue to serve together. We need to go beneath the waterline into our heart. And be driven by a heart and a love of one another. A love of Jesus, yes. But a love of one another as well. I've been going on a beautiful journey with my wife. Um, for the last six years I think. <laughs> and... Um, and recently, I've, we've been able to go to a new level, a new depth. And it's been really beautiful. Um, I've often operated myself, and, and I think most guys might be able to relate to me here, out of, a, out of a sense of obligation and duty. I know the right thing to do, and I know the right words to say, and I know what I ought to do and not ought to do. And when I'm in a good headspace, boom, I nail it. You know, I... <laughs> um, I can do the right thing and say the right thing and be the good husband and, um, well, I think I am anyway. It looks right. But I've often found that um, I'm not engaging in the heart. And I haven't known that until recently I've realized that, that I'm missing engaging wholeheartedly in that moment. And I've realized through being vulnerable and honest and at building a greater level of intimacy with my darling and I, that I've, I've fallen in love afresh and mahi that I would usually do out of obligation and be like, Burr. slightly slightly like, Burr, why isn't she doing this? It's not an issue when you're operating out of a place of love. And I think it transfers really well into the way we serve one another in the body of Christ is, is we can do the right thing because it looks right. We can do the right thing because it means we fit in right. We can do the right thing because it looks good. But we need to be driven by something deeper below the waterline of our life. And that comes out of our heart and overflow of love. The work of Jesus is not about behavior reformation or behavior reforming behavior and making um, bad people good. It's not that. It's about making people who are hopelessly dead in sin alive again. And that starts in the heart. And that starts an overflow of God working in our heart with His love and His power and His Holy Spirit transforming us. And this overflows in acts of love. I, I think I started this way as I become a fresh, passionate new member of the body of Christ because I sort of ran off and tried to do my own thing. And then I came back into um, a youth ministry that was awesome and I loved it. And I thought, this is so cool. And, and I started serving and I had a love for people and a love for... Um, 
my friends and I really wanted to see them saved. And as time goes on, um, sometimes our motivation falters and we become a little bit stuck in a rut. And I start doing the right thing and saying the right thing and looking right because I know it's the right thing. I know it's the right response. I know it's right to turn up and just keep turning up. And sometimes we, we our, our heart sort of falls out of it and it was full out of love. And, and I know the call of Jesus is to come back to a place of love this morning. Maybe you're growing weary and tired. Um, love doesn't grow tired. It, 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 it's, it's so patient and gracious. And if we're serving out of a place of obligation, I know I've done that so many times. I've served my wife out of a place of obligation. I hope I'm not alone there, guys. Um, I've served my children out of a place of obligation. Um, I've served in church out of a place of obligation. But Jesus says, there is, or Jesus through the Apostle Paul says, there is a more excellent way. There is a, a, a way that is driven by love. There is a story of, of two people driven by two very different um, motivations in Luke chapter 10. And it's a story we, we know, I believe, of Mary and Martha. Uh, Mary's invi- uh, Mar- Martha invites Jesus into her house. And she's then filled with a, a sense of obligation to serve. It's cultural. It's normal. It's, it's, there's a culture of, of, of you must give honor and to honor you must hospi- show hospitality. And some of us might relate to that, some of us not. And, and so you can't invite someone into your house and not serve them, not have them seated, maybe wash their feet, maybe prepare a meal for them, maybe make them a cup of tea or coffee, uh, put out the biscuits, put out the best tea and the silverware. Um, Mary is driven to serve, and it's hard and challenging because Jesus brought with him his whole group, his whole clique, his whole group of homies. So now Mary's, uh, Martha's feeling overwhelmed in serving Jesus. But not only that, as Martha isn't just representing herself, her whole family is on the line. Then their uh, mana, their, their honor, is on the line and serving well. And her sister, Mary, has the audacity to sit at the feet of Jesus. I believe that in the moment of Jesus coming into a, our house, into our circle, we have two. We have two, two wrestles, two tensions within ourselves. One is the wrestle of we want to fit in, we want to serve, we want to do and say the right thing. We're now in the presence of the great rabbi. And the other tension I believe that we feel in the presence of Jesus is we just want to fall at his feet and adore him. We want to fall at his feet and adore him. And I know that in my Christian life, so often I've fallen into the trap of, okay, Jesus is here, get busy. Um, There's something to do for God today. There's something I need to do to serve the family today, to serve the church today. There's turn up, get busy, get going, because that's how, that's what Jesus, there's this obligation to serve and and Jesus is, he calls Mary, uh, Martha out because Martha says, Hey, Jesus, tell Mary to help me out here. The server has the audacity to tell the master that there's something wrong with somebody else. We know that something's wrong when we're looking at what somebody else is doing and they're sitting in the same context as us. And we're like, what they're doing is wrong. Because they're not as active as me. This is what Martha does. She's not as active as me. She's in the wrong. Jesus says, hey, Martha, you're distracted. You're distracted. And he says, Mary has chosen what is better. She's chosen what is better. And I believe that that service can often get distracted. And Jesus calls us first to be people that wrestle with the tension of, oh, I really just want to sit at Jesus' feet and do seemingly nothing. But I know that Jesus, the sort of, I need to host him. I need to feel that, I need to, I need to do a good job. I need to uphold mana. Um, I need to uphold cultural practice. And Jesus says, only one thing's required here. And she's chosen it, to sit at my feet. If we're driven by a need to fulfill some obligation, Jesus says we're missing it. Christians are very active people. Christians in love with Jesus and people are very active. They're not passive. They don't just sit around at Jesus' feet all day, so to speak. But what's driven is below the waterline. A love and a desire for people. And you can see that in longevity. In my personal um, life and in ministry, I've seen people come and go. 
and they come in with great zeal and they love to fit in so they'll serve they love to be part of the team so they'll serve and and a little bit of an obstacle comes along and and they fall away and it's because there's something wrong below the waterline there hasn't been a transformation of the heart the desire to do what we do is an overflow of the love of God at work in us just lastly as I finish up as I've been reflecting on this passage I've realized that Paul speaks in the tense of like in the about himself here he says though I speak though I have the gift though I bestow my goods he doesn't talk about you or them he says though I have this though I do this but I'm not motivated by love I'm nothing I think when we come to examine ourselves below the waterline what's most helpful is we just look at ourselves. Don't compare yourself. Or don't look at the other person and think, I can examine below their waterline. That's, that's missing it. Jesus says, I want you to go below the surface and examine yourself. What's driving you today? What's driving you today? What's driving you to turn up? What's driving you to serve? Because for you to go the long haul, for you to go the distance, for you to feel the, the fullness and the experience of fullness of what God has for you in serving and in loving and in leading, in your family, and in church, and in evangelism, out on the street, in the workplace. The most excellent way for you to do this is in love. It is in love. Um, kia ora koutou. Uh, I love you. And I, I bring this because I love you. And uh, I, I, I pray that you are feeling love this morning. I pray that you are around people who love you this morning. If this, um, if you're feeling like, oh, I don't know what to do with this, I want to um, readdress why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to encourage you not just to sort of throw everything in the air and 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 sort of run away or whatever, but but maybe be honest with somebody because I believe that when we are vulnerable and honest with people, it creates intimacy and that's a place of love. And so find someone you trust and be really honest with them about what you're thinking and feeling about this. And um, let's see what the love of God wants to do and how the Holy Spirit wants to uh, minister to you uh, this morning. Uh, kia ora, koutou, um, nā reira, mia noi tato. Uh, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We thank you for the love that you showed us. Thank you for the demonstration of complete, full love. And thank you that that love is now at work in us. We want to be people motivated and driven by love as we look below the waterline and below the surface of our life. Um, and as we examine ourselves in this moment, Jesus, would you remind us of how much you love us and, uh, and what that overflow looks like. In Jesus' name, would you give us the bravery to be bold and courageous and be honest with someone to, um, yeah, if, if we're struggling with this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what a great message from Luke. Thank you, Luke, for sharing that message with us. It's so encouraging. Church, one way that you could serve in this time, and serving is such an important act of love, as Luke said, but one way that we can serve is by inviting people into our homes, inviting people out into our world, being pastoral, caring, reaching out for others. Right now, there's a great time that we can serve other people. I would love it if some of you today would consider inviting somebody over next Sunday to watch the service with you, to be a host of a watch party. I'd love it if you could invite people over to eat together, to pray together, and to go deep together. See, this is an opportunity for all of us. Being online doesn't mean we have to be isolated. We can invite people into our hearts and lives. We can go deeper deeper than maybe we get to over a coffee. We can go eat, we can eat lunch, we can eat breakfast. I'd encourage you, don't do church alone in these next couple of weeks. Invite somebody over, connect and do it together. Bless you guys. I love you. Take care. If you're sick, if you know somebody that's sick, let us know. We'd love to drop off some goodies and we'll see you in a few weeks.